Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Tuesday evening talk, um, which this evening is on the Untamed Terai and uh, is going to be presented by Sarah, uh, who you can see on your screen now as well. Um, just a quick um, advertisement for the next talks that we've got coming up, as I've got quite a lot of you on board. Um, uh, before we talk a little bit more about this one. Tomorrow, Brett is going to be giving a lunchtime talk, an in-depth talk on bear photography in spring, uh, which will be super. Thursday evening, um, Mark Coordin, who many of you know, will be doing um, a, uh, a, a photo critique of images that have been submitted. Um, that'd be great fun as well. Uh, very different from anything that we've done so far. And next Tuesday, Dan Free will be talking about Ethiopia. Um, but this evening, we have got Sarah, who, uh, the lovely Sarah, who's going to be chatting to us about um, the Untamed Terai. Um, and uh, what a lovely photograph to start the evening with, Sarah. That's, uh, that's a cool picture. Um, now, look, we will be delighted to answer questions um, from you at the end. Um, you guys will all be familiar with this. Um, you'll have done it. Um, you've been on board with us many times before. Um, please feel free to um, send questions and uh, um, I'll pose those questions to Sarah at the end. At the bottom of your screens, you should see um, Q&A. So please feel free to use that. Please feel free to also use um, the chat facility. Um, and then when we get to the questions and answers, I will pose a question to you all as well. So don't be surprised if that suddenly appears on your screen. Um, but I really need to hand over to you, don't I, Sarah? Thank you. Let you take control. Oh, hi. Right. And then, um, and I'll chat to you again when you've finished your, your presentation. All right. Thanks, Claire. See you later. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining again for another um, evening, uh, this time to discover the untamed terai. So firstly, let me explain to you what the terai is. Um, some of you may already know, of course, um, and some of you may have Googled it if you didn't know. Um, and if you'd done that, you would have received a brief description saying that the terai is a lowland region which lies south of the outer foothills of the Himalayas and north of the Indo-Gangetic Plain. So it's sandwiched between the two. And it extends through northern India and southern Nepal, meaning that this evening we're going to be exploring a landscape rather than a single country. So as I mentioned earlier, it's a, it's a thin belt sandwiched and um, the width of this belt um, is between 25 and 45 kilometers wide at any given point. And the actual majority of the Terai landscape lies in the pool. And you can see here in this map, um, there's a natural kind of flow and the corresponding, corresponding lowland region in West Bengal, Bangladesh, Bhutan, and part of Assam is known as the Duras. Duras sorry. Um, and this shares some similar characteristics and similar wildlife um, characterized, for example, uh, by the Indian one-horn rhino population in Assam's Kasparanga. Um, but in the Terai Arc landscape, there are several protected areas which were established um, in the late 1950s. And in this itinerary, we're going to be visiting five of these. You'll notice that this is a, a World Wildlife Fund map, and um, that's because they've established a landscape-based conservation project, um, and that aims to protect this corridor of wildlife um, going through two countries, and we'll touch on that later. Grasslands and forests are the two main habitats of the Terai. Um, the typical uh, species of grasslands in, throughout is, is elephant grass, which is an impressive species. Um, it's quite disorientating because it reaches um, about four meters high. It's actually the, the tallest grass species in the world. So this does certainly 
obviously make wildlife watching a little bit more challenging, um, but it also makes it really exciting because you never know what might just step out from the grass and emerge um, whilst you're out on safari. And as well as the grasslands, uh, the forests of the Turai, they vary um, from lush and dense jungles um, into some kind of more spread out with a bit more sunlight penetrating in as well. I began my journey um, through this landscape in, in Nepal, visiting Chitwan and then Bardia before crossing into India at the end, but there's no reason why you can't do it in reverse as well. Um, but just for sake of uh, following my journey and our group tour, uh, we're going to start in Nepal. And you can see on this map um, that I've marked where we will visit in Nepal by the paw prints, and also there's an arrow to show where we cross over. So Chitwan is Nepal's most popular park due to its proximity to um, the main uh, tourist attractions of Kathmandu and Pokhara. Um, so it's more accessible um, and it is often combined for people visiting there, um, for tourists to go to Chitwan for a bit of wildlife after they've been exploring the Himalayas and, and such. But when we travel west in Nepal um, towards Bardia, it's very rarely visited by tourists um, and it's a really, really off the beaten track experience. You'll notice in this map that um, both of the, the, the parks that we'll be visiting, Chitwan and Bardia, align with two of Nepal's three main rivers, um, the Kali in Chitwan and the Kanali in Bardia. And both of these rivers flow south and join the Ganges in India. So starting in Nepal, after a flight via Delhi, we arrive into Kathmandu. And straight away, if any of you have been to Kathmandu before, it's, it's full on experience. You've got mopeds weaving through the traffic, blowing their horns, you've got food sellers and street dogs navigating the roads. It's busy, it's colorful, it's exciting, and it immediately awakens your senses after your flight over from the UK. There's some wonderful hotels in Kathmandu, and whether you're staying for one night or longer, um, it's a really great experience being in the city. We suggest staying at a hotel called Dwarikas, um, which is a really stunning place. And as soon as you step through the doors, um, they've got this courtyard and the rooms are around it in a, in a square and you forget that you're in a busy city. The noise doesn't seem to enter it. It's like a place of tranquility. Kathmandu itself is fascinating. It has more UNESCO World Heritage Sites than any other city in the world, which is quite a remarkable statistic. It has seven in just 15 kilometer radius. Um, so I would really suggest spending some time there out exploring. And whilst you're out weaving through the bustling streets, you might just turn a corner and find yourself in a serene pedestrian square which tend to find themselves in the middle of these um, and as well as being a refuge from us from traffic and busyness they're also a favorite place for macaques and pigeons and uh, given given any square in 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 Kathmandu you will find hundreds of pigeons and I know pigeons are not the reason that anyone will be traveling to Nepal and I'm not going to try and sell you Nepal based on its pigeon population um, but I just wanted to talk to you about it because this was one of my first experiences when I arrived was to see a group of people helping a street pigeon. Now, we have heaps of pigeons in the UK and it would be a very rare sight, I think, to see anyone doing this here. And to me, it just really illustrates the appreciation of nature, which I saw during my trip throughout. Leaving the fascinating Kathmandu Valley behind, uh, we travel by road to reach Chitwan by mid-afternoon. This is an image uh, from Chitwan and it's on the Rapti River, which flows um, east to west and forms the north border of the national park. 
So every time that you cross into the park from your lodge, you'll have to cross this river. And the lodge itself, um, which we'll be spending the, the next three nights at, is called Tiger Tops Taru Lodge. And it's a unique lodge nestled beside this lush forest and right on the edge of the park. It's got just 12 rooms and nine safari tents. Um, and it's a really small and intimate place, but it's built in this tradition, traditional Taru style. So the Taru people are an ethnic group indigenous to the Tarai, and until the late 1950s, they were the only inhabitants of the Chitman Valley because they had a natural resistance to malaria. Don't worry by me saying the words malaria, it's not the case anymore. So you don't need to worry about taking anti-malarials on your visit because in, 19, um, in the 1950s, there was a massive malaria eradication program, uh, which meant that many other people kind of flooded into the region and co consequently huge tracts of forest were cleared to make space for farmland. Um, and this is just an, a bit of an ongoing issue where human um, encroachment into the national park can cause some conflict with the wildlife. So tourism in the area is, is really um, important as an incentive to protect the park. But at the lodge itself, there's this, this beautiful uh, garden around it, uh, which provides a, a tranquil setting for us to have a welcome drink. Um, and during the rest of our stay here, we enjoy afternoons, relaxing, lunches out in the garden and evening bonfires here. Between activities, your guide can take you birding um, in the lodge grounds as well. But once you've refreshed um, and settled into the lodge, you head out on the first safari of the trip. And entering, once you've crossed the river um, and you're entering the forest, you discover its magical spectral quality as the, the beams of afternoon sunlight filter through the canopy. And knowing what animals you might um, kind of step into this beautiful scene really fills you with, with a great um, anticipation for the safari ahead. Um, vehicle safaris will be one of the modes of transport during this holiday and these are in open top Land Rovers which give you incredible 360 viewing as you search for some of the parks, roughly 70 species of animals and roughly 500 species of birds. And as you move through the forest looking for wildlife Rest assured, you'll also be being watched, so don't forget to look up as well for some of the owl species kind of resting on the branches. And also crested serpent eagle, like in this photograph here, um, one of many impressive raptors that you'll see throughout the Terai. And this raptor thrives in the habitat because um, they love to hunt in areas where the forest comes very close to the wet grasslands, and that's where they hunt reptiles. So it's ideal habitat for them. Um, and also it's an environment that's really well suited to one of the main draws to Chitwan, which is the magnificently bizarre Indian one-horned rhino. Um, they have this armored appearance where it looks as though their skin was created three times too big for their body and it's hardened in folds and dimples all around them. Um, their horns are much smaller than their African cousins, and so is their behaviour. They're a lot shyer um, than African rhino. And they prefer to graze in pockets of grassland um, at the edge of the forest, which is really helpful because it means that they're not difficult to find. Um, and going out with our very experienced team of guides, you have the opportunity, which is remarkable and rare to approach them on foot um, and you can walk quite quite closely but at a respectable distance and just sit and enjoy them uh, enjoy watching them as they casually graze away so in the in the 70s the numbers fell um, in Chitwan to less than 100 um, so the Royal Chitwan National Park was established and a really strict anti-poaching measures and protection of the forest area were introduced. Um, 
But since then, the Indian one horn rhino here has increased, um, the population has increased fivefold. Um, so this park, Chitwan, health, boasts one of the healthiest populations um, of this species. And they've actually sent several individuals off to different parks, including Dudwa in India, to help other populations grow. And you may have heard about this because only last week it was actually on the news here in the UK because I think um, a little bit of good news at the moment um, is what we all need to hear. And for us wildlife lovers, having some good conservation news about wildlife um, is just wonderful. And I'm just gonna quickly touch on another conservation project, which you'll have the opportunity um, to, to see and to learn about. Um, and that is called the Vulture Restaurant. And a uh, visit here will be sometime between breakfast and lunch, and importantly, not too close to either, um, as you can probably guess why. So vulture populations here were really affected because of um, the introduction of an antibiotic in the cattle. And this antibiotic um, had devastating effects um, on, on vultures. And this meant that numbers dropped, they plummeted, but then the, the antibiotic has been banned. Uh, but they still need help in recovering their populations. So what happens here is um, any livestock nearby in communities which is old or dying is bought by the project, which is uh, partly funded by the state at, at the lodge. Um, and these cattle, which are old or sick, essentially go into a care home until they pass away. <laughs> And our guide, who is a conservationist and is the founder of this project, was telling us about one particular cow, um, which they bought because it was apparently on its last legs. Um, and it's, yeah, a few years in and loving its retirement home um, and has escaped um, the, the vulture restaurant for now. Um, however, when an animal does die, it's brought on the site um, and we sat in a hide as seven of Nepal's nine vulture species, represented by many, many individuals, descended on this carcass. And here you can see a juvenile Eurasian griffin vulture dominating the photo as he did the carcass. But you'll also see slender-billed, red-headed, Egyptian, long-billed, uh, white-rumped, um, and also Cinereus um, vulture. And the Cinereus vulture, as you can see, the main one in this picture, dominated the carcass too. And they're quite a striking bird. You'll see the tags um, on the most of the individuals. And that's because when we're sat in this hide, um, there were also several um, conservationists sat with us and they were busy furiously collecting all the data um, of the individuals which had come to visit the high, uh, visit the carcass. Um, and again, vultures might not be your cup of tea or your attraction, but um, I think it's always a privilege to see where your, um, your, what you're bringing as a tourist in, in terms of helping the conservation in the area. And it's a privilege to watch conservation projects in action. Um, the two species of vultures, which you're not likely to see in this region, but are found in Nepal are the Himalayan griffin vulture and the Lamagaya. So leaving the vulture re restaurant, um, one of your afternoons you will take to the river and um, you basically will float downstream on one of these um, wooden boats, uh, relaxing into the gentle pace of the river um, and wildlife watching as you go. You certainly will see um, laid up on the banks the ominous, thuggish looking uh, mugger crocodile. And these guys will eat pretty much anything, um, often next to them, but also just kind of spread down the banks of the river are the gharial. And these are native to the northern parts of the Indian subcontinent, um, but they have a, a distribution which is only 2% of their historical range. So incredibly reduced um, and no surprises therefore that they are critically endangered, which makes them really um, special to see. And unlike the mugger crocodile, uh, these guys are more particular in their diet. 
Um, and you can see here they have this incredibly long, slender tax snout and uh, full of over 100 sharp and locking, locking teeth. And this is uh, because they're very adept at catching fish. So they're a specifically fish eating species. Um, and also, I think, the most elegant of the crocodilians. But as you float downstream quietly, um, it's great to listen uh, and watch, the, listen to and watch for the bird life um, along the river, such as the Asiatic open bill stork. Um, and also one of the world's highest flying birds at the top in the top picture here, um, the bar-headed goose, um, who migrate from Um, there are even unverified reports that they have flown over the top of Everest, which is very impressive. Um, in the bottom of the picture here, we have the uh, very noisy, ruddy shell duck, where, which will be a continuous background soundtrack to your river cruise. So from, from Chitwan, you continue west along Nepal's east-west highway, which intersects the whole um, width of the country. And this is a long journey, so we include a stop at the birthplace of Lord Buddha, of all places. And it's a, obviously a really important Buddhist pilgrimage site, and the place is called Lumbini. So you'll have the opportunity to visit some beautiful temples and the birthplace of Lord Buddha. Um, but the next morning you will continue to Bardia. And as you do so, the vehicles um, and the other tourists will become fewer and fewer as you head into Nepal's wild west. And some consider a remote, unexplored wilderness a bit daunting, but to others, this is the off the beaten track experience that we really yearn to have and is increasingly hard to find. Um, our dear, a truly remote wilderness um, eludes the bustle, which has often synonymous with, with many tiger parks. Um, so you're afforded this, this rare freedom to explore as well on foot or by vehicle. You're not constrained by one way systems. Uh, you can stop for picnic, picnics, lunches, breakfast and enjoy a full day in the park. So this park is an oasis of calm as a tourist, um, but it's also wonderful for wildlife. And like in Chitwan, drivers are, drives are taken in these reconditioned open top Land Rovers. Um, and at any area, provided it's safe and there's not a tiger next to your vehicle, um, you can go on a walk with your naturalist guide and leave your vehicle. And when you're out walking, you follow the trails which have been created by the wildlife only. We followed some animal tracks uh, to the edge of a tributary of the Kanali River, and we watched um, the turquoise uh, jewel-like white-throated kingfishers going about their day, um, dropping into the water for some fish. And as we wandered along, our guide gestured to some very fresh tiger tracks um, and a patch of flattened grass, which was a tiger's bed from the previous night. And it was amazing to be standing right at the site where only a few hours earlier, a tiger had recently slept and you could actually smell it. Um, so we're kind of heightened um, senses um, and we hear this barking, um, calling um, of a barking deer, a muncher, on the other side of the river. Um, and it sent this alarm reverberating, not just through the forest, but through our chests as well, telling everyone around telling all the other deer, the monkeys and us that there's a tiger very close by. Um, unlike chital deer, barking deer have reliable um, alarm calls or they're more reliable in their alarm calling. So we quickly headed um, a short distance to where our Land Rover with the driver had come to meet us and we crossed the river um, in search of this tiger. Um, so full of anticipation, we drove um, along one of the tracks and thinking that we'd gone a bit too far perhaps, we turned back and we saw that the footprints had been laid on top of our tracks. So we had just missed 
um, this sighting. But we knew that we had come extremely close and that in itself was incredibly exciting. However, I traveled in December um, and at this time of year, the vegetation is thicker. So although it is a good time to travel, the best time is January through March um, when season's getting drier. So the vegetation's getting thinner and um, wildlife is a bit more concentrated on um, water sources. Bardia has a very healthy tiger population. Um, it's estimated to have around 500 individuals um, and they are more elusive than in some of the Indian parks. But any sighting that you do have is going to be extremely special. Um, so the reward for a tiger sighting here, where you have it to yourself, most likely, um, is, is worth the um, worth the go, in my opinion. So in the same afternoon, on another walk um, in the same park, we did have an amazing encounter. Myself and three other guests and our guide were on foot when we had this amazing private um, face to face um, with an adult male one horned rhino. And I just think these guys really look like something you'd charge into battle on. Um, it's just a bizarre, wonderful looking creature. And it's a really serene landscape in which you see the wildlife here and um, it makes it great for a photography opportunities as well um, because of these lovely um, long grasses making a frame for your subject. This um, photo wasn't my own, um, but it's a smooth coated otter and they've got very healthy populations in both Chitlan and Bardia National Parks, as do sloth bear and leopard um, throughout the Terai. The bird life is just fantastic too. And this is a striking uh, pied hornbill. Um, they announce their presence um, quite loudly. So um, you won't miss them as they dash between the trees. Red whiskered bulbul are constant throughout the Terai as are the black hooded oriole. Um, during our full day safari in Bardia, we were walking along the riverbank when um, the team from Tiger Top surprised us with a bush lunch in this clearing. Um, and there was a bar with gin and tonics and beer and the chefs cooked up a traditional buffet. So we sat in the camp chairs by the river and black headed orioles were darting above us and um, in the water adjacent to us, there were drongos bathing um, and it was a really special experience. Then after a full day of exploring the park, we head back to Tiger Top's Karnali Lodge, uh, which is the sister property to the lodge in Chitran. Um, this is our base for the next three nights again. Um, and you can see here the main building and it's built in this traditional, again, Taru style uh, with a central fire pit. And this is where everyone gathers in the morning for their tea and coffee. And at the end of the day, to sit around the fire and share your stories. The lovely relaxed atmosphere at the lodge. And I've just got to say how exquisite the food is as well. Uh, like Tiger Tops, Taru and Chitwan, they have their own vegetable garden. And because the terai is so fertile, um, we had just heaps of delicious fresh produce um, cooked amazingly. But as much as the main area is great, um, it's also lovely to spend some time in your rooms, which are these beautiful, comfortable um, ensuite rooms. Um, but you won't want to spend too long in there because the lodge itself is set adjacent to the park. So there's, there's no fence um, between the lodge grounds and the park, which means the wildlife tends to freely move through the grounds. You really give, um, it really gives you this feeling of being in the wilderness. Um, so if you're not sitting on your porch, watching the bird life, or sat by the campfire reading your book, um, then your guide will happily take you birding around during downtime. Some people may choose to end their safari 
here if you're doing it tailor-made and only want to visit Nepal and to do so you head uh, from Bardia National Park um, south east to Nepal Gunj and it's just a short drive and from here there's an airport and you can fly back to Kathmandu. However for myself and for the group tour and for the landscape of the Terai it continues. Um, and from Bardia, you have an hour and a half drive to the border um, called Dangadi border. And for Nepali, Nepali and Indian nationals, um, if this is an open border, um, but of course for tourists, there is an immigration process required, um, which was a bit of an experience. Um, once the official was found and the hut was unlocked and the logbook opened, I could see why. And that's because looking at the dates logs, I was the fourth international person to cross the border in two weeks, um, which just shows how off the beaten track this place is. Now, once you're over the border, it's really not long at all. Within 20 minutes, you're traveling through Dudwa Forest on your way to the next lodge. Now that a very few maps which illustrate the Terai landscape. Um, it actually extends further in both directions than you can see here. Um, but this map is really ideal to show you um, the proximity between Bardia and the final destination of Dudwa. And there's a lot going on here, but if you look at the three dark green areas on the map, these are Chitwan, Bardia and Dudwa, and they are considered as core tiger areas um, and the other shades, different colours, um, show the connectivity between them. Um, it's also quite a helpful map to illustrate the, the topography when I say that this belt lies below the mountains. Um, you can see that in the folds in the image. Dudwa Tiger Reserve includes Dudwa National Park, Katem Nagat Wildlife Sanctuary, um, Kishampur Wildlife Sanctuary, and it's all of these that we will explore during our time at Jagir Lodge. Reaching the lodge, there is a brick road which winds up through a lychee grove and, and brings you to this beautiful building. And this is the base from which you'll explore the surrounding parks. And we're here for four nights, so we've got ample time to really um, explore properly. Within the lodge grounds, there's wonderful bird life. Uh, you've got the eye-catching racket-tailed drongos adorning the trees. Um, and at some nearby lakes, um, only a short five minute drive from the lodge, you'll go to for sunset. And it, there's a remarkable um, experience where parakeets um, announce their return to these roosts, which are on the lake, kind of on an island in the middle. And they noisily announce the beginning of this process. And once the parakeets have landed, they're followed by hundreds of egrets. And they arrive from all directions and they find somehow find a space amongst each other on the grass lake island, um, which is their roost. But once dusk settles, um, you will have somewhere around dinner, before or after, depending on how hungry you are. Um, your safari isn't over by any means because you'll head out um, with your torches on the nearby lanes and you'll be searching for nocturnal species like fish and cat um, and perhaps some nocturnal bird species like the spot-bellied eagle owl. So there's lots of exciting wildlife to be seen from here. Heading to um, Kispanshur, um, there's beautiful south forest environment and it's home to tiger, leopard and sloth bear, but the forests are punctuated with these lakes and that's what distinguishes this park to the others in the tiger reserve. On these lakes there's several um, lines around it and from here you can watch the water birds um, as they gather and you'll see in the background um, of this photograph, apologies it's a really terrible photograph that I took, but you can see um, the Barasinga, and these are the 12 horned deer 
Um, they've got a really limited range and this is one of their strongholds. So it's quite an unusual species to see. And what's really amazing about these deer is that quite often you'll see them lying right next to a mother crocodile. Um, they don't seem to um, be bothered by one another. Um, at Katanagat, you, which is another one of the parks, um, you head out in jeep safaris again into the forest um, in search of, of wildlife, all the wildlife of tigers, elephant, uh, sloth bear. Uh, but also at sunset, instead of heading right back to the lodge, you have the opportunity to take a boat ride along the river. Um, when we were doing our boat ride, it was this beautiful sunset and this huge tusker bull elephant came down to drink. But we were too busy to really go over and see this elephant because um, we were following a pod of Gangetic river dolphins on their sightless hunt for fish. And I tried to take some photographs of these um, dolphins and failed miserably. So I put my camera down and I just watched because I knew how special it was to see them. Um, really wonderful um, opportunity. And here as well, you've got a really good population of gharial crocodile too. The final of the three reserves which you will visit in this area is the Dudworth Reserve. Um, and this is the typical morning scene as you're heading early doors into the forest. It's got this ethereal, ethereal mist which shrouds you. Um, it's both atmospheric and eerie to an extent. Um, and as you make your way into the forest, you find yourself immersed in it as the sun starts to push through the trees and, and the birds wake up around you. By the time the sun's rays have penetrated the forest, you find yourself deep in there and really welcoming the warmth of the sun. And the light which comes with it um, is just very special. Um, and also that combined with the exclusivity of you being one of the few people traveling through the forest. Again, this isn't one of my photographs, um, but it is taken in Dudwa Reserve uh, by one of the guides. It's a really stunning photograph, I think you'll all agree, of one of the tigers of the area. And just to summarize that the Terai landscape is not one that you hear about really often, uh, but that's not because it lacks biodiversity. It's not because it doesn't have rare and exciting species. It's not inaccessible or unaffordable destination. It's remained off the beaten track. Um, and that's partly because sightings are a little bit more hard work. But for me, if you love the off the beaten track experience where you don't share it with other people, and you get these really rewarding sightings and experiences when you do have them. And this is a really special place to visit. Um, so finishing your safari from Jagir Lodge, you end and you drive a um, short distance to Lucknow um, where you catch a flight on Delhi. Um, so that's the end of your journey through the untamed Terai. Um, and as often the case, we offer this as a small group tour of six, but can be arranged on a bespoke basis as well. So hopefully um, you've got some questions and I would really love to answer and I'm sure Chris will pop on to say hi. Great stuff. Thank you very, very much. Gosh, that was lovely. I, um, I've only been to that area once and it was years and years and years ago. And I remember thinking how fantastic it was. I went to Bardia and to uh, Chitwan and of course Kathmandu and so on and I loved it I absolutely loved it I thought it was gorgeous absolutely gorgeous anyway that's super that's another place to put on my list um, of places that I need to go when we're allowed to travel um, <laughs> so uh, had got a few questions which is nice um, it's always nice we always have questions um, as you know so the first one um, is about temperatures Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, sort of like the, the, the general um, uh, feeling of comfort or discomfort, you know, when, when you're away. Mm. 
Uh, Janine says, what are the temperatures like in February, March, and also in November? I guess it sounds as though Janine is planning to travel to that area, but possibly weighing up one either November or, or, or um, Feb, March. So I guess perhaps you may have some thoughts as to which is better and are the mornings cool? Yes, yes. So thank you, Janine. Um, definitely any time within that period, the mornings are cold because you're going out early um, and you're in a vehicle. So you've got to wrap up warm in the mornings. Um, but the nights, the temperature doesn't tend to fall below 10 degrees. Um, so it's not, it's not like horribly cold, um, but it's not warm um, in the nights and in the mornings. But in the daytime, in November, it's early 20s is the maximum heat in the day. Um, and then going through into, into March, it goes up until um, about 30 degrees, um, but it does, doesn't ever get too hot. It's when it, you're going into kind of April, May, June, which is the rainy season, so you want to avoid that anyway. That's when it gets to your mid thirties. So it's a really pleasant climate to be to be in. Okay, that's cool. And and Janine has also posed. I didn't realise it was Janine that posed another question as well. Um, but um, she uh, so the, the two tours that we've got in the Tarai, one we, or at least that we put on our website. Of course, we can tailor make anything, but but. Um, we have one um, trip idea and we have one group tour, don't we? Um, and one of the trips, the tailor-made itinerary, we mentioned a place called, Pil I'm not sure to pronounce it correctly, Pilibit Tiger Reserve. Did you get there? I think perhaps you didn't on your trip, did you? No, so I didn't. Um, but if you're wanting to go to Pilibit, that's absolutely possible from Jagir Lodge. Um, right. But because we, at myself and I think I stayed for three nights and on our group tour we stayed for four nights but if you're wanting to do all of those parks um, on a tailor-made basis we suggest probably five night nights because it yeah. is a full day you want a full day in Pillibit um, and then you want to have a full day in Dudworth and then kind of like a half day in each of the others as well so it's just a, if you give it enough time and Pillibit is um, also really um, established wildlife um, like that tiger reserve um so it's a good place to go to see tiger as well fab okay so that sounds good and um have you got any thoughts on in this particular part of the world on um a group tour versus tailor-made what would you what would you favor i guess to an extent it depends on what sort of thing you what you want to get out of it but what have you got any thoughts on that i think um the benefits of the group tour um are wonderful I think it's really nice to travel with like-minded people um, and sometimes people see them in a bit of more of a negative light but when you have them as a size of six that none of those negatives are there because you've got so much space in the boat you've got space in your vehicle so your viewing isn't hampered by sharing it with five other people you know group tour sizes of six I think are a really lovely way to travel um, but so I, I would personally go that way um, but I think if you're doing tailor-made, if you're by any way restricted by dates, um, then you're going to meet some lovely people at the lodges and the guides are fantastic. So both are good options. So I was going to say, um, so Howard has asked how many people there are in the group, which of course you answered during the course of your presentation anyway, but perhaps just to reiterate on the group tours, we, we take a maximum of six people, which as you say is lovely, because not only are you enjoying all of your game viewing together and, you know, which combines... Um, mammals and birds and so on but you're then eating dinner together in the evenings and all that sort of stuff it can be really lovely can't it just yeah. just something as a, as a nice nice friendly group of people with, with like-minded um like-minded interests um absolutely yeah. and, and, and equally of course there's no reason on earth why you can't do the group trip and then um you know we can we can tailor stuff at the beginning and end so you know we can you can meet meet the group in Kathmandu after having already done something else yeah um, before the trip or 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 we can tell you make something you know after the after the, the groups departed so um it's quite flexible um john asks whether there is a particularly high is it is it, uh, is it an area of high humidity um did you experience a lot of humidity when you were there that puts a lot of people off doesn't it 
No, it wasn't humid. Um, I think go because because we're quite specific and what we recommend is the best time to go there. It's just those four months that we really say is the best to go and, and it's really pleasant temperature when you're there. It's not hot and humid. Um, I think if you're worried about it being warmer, I'd say go, go a bit earlier, maybe yeah. November, December. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's a really comfortable temperature. And did you have good guides when you were there? The guides were amazing, um, I think as, as always. Um, but like I was saying about the guide who was also a conservationist and set up that vulture restaurant, yeah. it just shows the passion uh, for the wildlife that all the guides had. Um, and that, like talking about the pigeons earlier, it's just, it was a real um, constant throughout is, is the passion for the wildlife and obviously the knowledge as well. And coming kind of face to face on foot with big wildlife like um, rhinos and having a good guide is so important. And they were just so calm and confident really? and they just knew exactly what they're doing. And it makes the whole experience so much like it really really enjoyable rather than there's no concerns are there at all and it's, it makes it exciting doesn't it especially if you've seen if you've been in africa and seen wildlife on foot it's lovely seeing wildlife on foot i, I love seeing wildlife on foot it's a it's a fantastic thing um so um getting to Kathmandu, how do you how do how do you get to Kathmandu? um so it's normally a flight via delhi um unfortunately we don't there's any direct flight so um go via delhi so if you want to spend a bit of time in india beforehand or uh, fly out to Kathmandu a little bit earlier um we can arrange that to you and also if you're flying because Kathmandu is the starting point um like chris you just mentioned you might want to go elsewhere you can do that at the start of the group tour you might want to go up to Pokhara um because there's there's a, so much biodiversity and, and, and bird life um in nepal and obviously in this trip we're visiting one of those landscapes but if you head up to Pokhara there's some amazing birding to be done there where you're at the just just kind of in the Himalayas a little bit and and seeing different species so back then back to Kathmandu and start the group tour. Fab and did you did your did your guides um were they good on birds? Yeah. From a personal point of view I love mammals but I also love Kind of things and lots of people would want to go there lots of people might want to do a trip like this on a tailor-made basis purely and simply just for just to see the birds the guides yeah so we had um really good bird guides and actually in all of the lodges they sold um the the bird um books for nepal yeah. um and everyone that i was traveling with ended up buying them because they wanted mm. um they weren't um birders who i was traveling with but by the end mm. of the trip they were and um have ever since that trip have taken up birding um one of one of the girls i'm in touch with and she um that was her first ever bird book that she was inspired to get having had the guides there and um ever since then she's just bought about 10 different bird books because she's oh, that's gone fantastic. From not a birder to a converted birder <laughs> from mm -hmm. that trip but you can't fail when they're lovely things like you know the, like that fantastic photo of the hornbill that you showed and i had one two comments about that when when you when you showed that um um, and bee eaters and um, storks and all this sort of stuff. They're, they're fantastic. You can't fail to to enjoy those kind of things, even if you're even if you're not interested in birds. They're just great because they're so full of colour. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So so um, a couple of other questions. Um, Sandra has asked about insects and uh, whether you are likely to encounter lots of insects on this trip or this in at least in this area. Yeah, I mean, there, there are insects around, um, of course, but um, we, I, there wasn't any problems. I didn't, I didn't get bitten once during the whole trip. Um, I think as long as you've got long sleeves on and um, a bit of insect repellent, it's not something to be concerned about here. Um, okay, well, that, that's good. That's worth knowing. And um, Whilst people are, uh, I'll put the, put the poll, uh, the, the question up, as the last couple of times I've forgotten to do it until right at the end and I'm a complete twit, but anyway, today is no, no, no different. Um, uh, but of the accommodations that you stayed in, um, 
Which was your favourite and why? That's, re that's a really tough question um, because they're all, they were all amazing, but I, I think the Tiger Tops, the sister Tiger Top properties, possibly the one in Bardia was my favourite because I just love that traditional building with the central fire pit. Yeah. Um, I love that kind of sitting around the fire pit with people at the end, end of the day and starting with a coffee around the fire pit. Um, I just, that, just like that's we in Africa, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And this, everyone that worked there was just amazing as well. And how yeah. many, is that, that's not a big place, is it? No, no, it's, um, gosh, I think it's got about 10 rooms. Okay. So something like that. But yeah. when we went, because we because we were at the start of the season, it was, um, I think, it was only half full. And I don't think it's often full, um, really? just because it is so, it is just off the beaten track, definitely. Well, um, so I think, um, I think I've, I've probably asked all of the questions, um, but thank you very, very much for such a lovely presentation. And furthermore, hang on a minute, I've had another couple of questions. Um, <laughs> it's always the way. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I'm just before we finish then, um, um, minimum age on the group, in, in a group, um, Ali has said um, that um, her son will be 16 in July of this year, I presume. Um, I can't see a problem with a 16 year old um, going on a trip. I thought, what, what a wonderful thing to do. Um, no, be great. Can't see a problem with that, can you? No, no, there'll be no problem with that. Um, we'd be happy. happy yeah. Having a board. That's, that's, that's what I thought. So, um, Ali, there's your answer it's to a that. Great, it's a great interactive experience as well for, you know, yeah. for, for every age group. It's, yeah. Brilliant. Oh, it'd be, be wonderful to have a 16 year old on that trip. Um, and then, um, and then John has asked what time in the, um, what time in the morning do the morning safaris go out? I'm guessing it's at, at, um, you know, absolutely early doors, is it? But I may be wrong. Yeah, it's early doors, um, you know, to get into the forest when the when the light breaks through. So, you know, you're not setting your alarm at, at silly o'clock, but you're kind of having a very quick breakfast or you're taking breakfast, pack breakfast with you. And you are you want to be really gone from the lodge by, by seven latest. Really. And there tends to be um, early nights as well because it gets quite dark. Um, so you're not unless you're drinking by the fire till late, which is also fine. <laughs> but you can go to bed early in preparation. So, um, so Margaret has basically, uh, M Margaret has posed a question to, to say, what's the difference between the two trips? I mean, in essence, the difference between the two trips is that, I mean, they're, they're visiting similar places, aren't they? It's a similar, they are similar trips. Um, um, you, you know more about them than I do. Of course, one is a group departure and one is um, a bespoke tailor-made trip. But are there, are yeah. there significant differences than that, would you say? Not not yeah. really, no. Um if you're if you're doing it um privately and you don't mind a long journey, if you want to travel between Bardia and Chitwan, you can do that in one long day. In the group trip, we split it with a night in Lumbini yeah. at, at the Buddha um birthplace of Lord Buddha. Um but they're very, very similar at, you know, on the Tailor made option, we have it going in the reverse, but there's no real reason you can do it. I mean, it works just as well going uh, north, northwest to southeast as it does going southeast to northwest, kind of thing. Cool. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, look, uh, Sarah, thank you so much. That was absolutely super. As I say, I mean, it's an area that I've been to, but many years ago, I haven't had an opportunity to, to, to go back there for a long time. Um, and it's a place I want to go now, again. But there's lots <laughs> of oh my god, I just want to go somewhere. Um, yeah. But um, hey, look, thank you so much, and thank you everybody for um, uh, for being on board with us this evening. Um, don't forget to uh, join on at one o'clock tomorrow for Brett, who is doing one of the in-depth talks about bear photography in spring. Um, and then on Thursday evening, um, Mark Cowardine doing a, um, a photography critic um, Mark who was as many of you will know um, the chairman of the wildlife photographer of the year um, panel uh, so um, well 
his his um, his critiquing will be um, will be will be excellent. I have absolutely no doubt, and good fun too. Um, Sarah, once again, thank you so much, um, and thank you everybody for being with us. Thank we'll see you. you again soon. Bye.